Hello and welcome to episode number 219. This is the Project Management Podcast at pm-podcast.com and I am Cornelius Fichtner. Nice to have you with us. This is once again one of our premium episodes recorded, especially for all our premium subscribers. Thank you so much for your support. And by the way, did you know that if you are a PMP, you can earn PDUs just by listening to this interview here today? If you didn't know and you'd like to find out more, please go to the website pm-podcast.com slash PDU and learn about the 30 free PDUs that you can get as a subscriber of this podcast here. Karin Brünnemann made an excellent case last time describing how all our projects are in some way or another influenced by culture. We did also take a brief look at a few tools that she recommends. But how do you really become adept at mastering intercultural issues on your project? What are some of the actions that you can take? And what tools are recommended? And what are some of the qualities of a good intercultural project manager? Well, listen up and enjoy the interview. The Project Management Podcasts Feature Interview. Today with Karin Grunemann, PMP, Intercultural Expert. Hallo Karin, nochmals herzlich willkommen hier beim Projektmanagement Podcast. Hallo Cornelius. Very well. In our first interview, we discussed intercultural project management, the challenges and the benefits. We didn't really go much into the, well, how are we going to do this? And that is the goal of this discussion right now. How are we going to become a more intercultural project manager? And uh, what we're going to do is we are going to go through six of the how-tos that you suggest, uh, giving you an opportunity to discuss each of these six for a moment here. So let's just get started with the first one. The first one that you suggested is to include intercultural issues in the kickoff session, as well as putting it into the budget so that you have the money for it, right? Right. Um, this is where... Um, many projects already um, fail in terms of intercultural management because uh, if they have at all sufficient funding and sufficient time for proper kickoff sessions and team building activities, they usually don't gear them towards um, intercultural issues. All right, moving on to the second one. The second one is to consider language on your project. And more than just that, you say uh, that we need to agree on a project language, right? Right. I have, it's, it's again my own experience. I have been in projects where the project language was not clearly defined and all of a sudden people started to demand to have documentation and manuals in, in different languages and they were not available. So I would advise that as a project manager, agree on a common project language. If you can, it can also be two or three and put it into the overall project communication plan so that everybody is aware of uh, which languages or language is going to be used in the project and uh, for the documentation, for training material and so on. So if we have one project language that we define on our project, that means that some people are native in that language and others are not. Won't that lead to other issues here? Uh, correct. Um, so I suggest to always target your language at non-native speakers. The native speakers will be able to understand anyway and the non-native speakers can can still follow you. So uh, don't use very complicated language. Don't use uh, technical terms that are not widely known. Don't use acronyms that are maybe very specific to, to a certain country or, or language to enable everybody to participate. But having said that, I would like to also point out that language, even when you are a speaker, 
a native speaker still needs cultural context. For example, take the sentence, I have no work tomorrow. If this sentence is said in native English by a widowed mother of seven children in rural India, it can mean that she doesn't have any work tomorrow, she can't earn money, she can't feed her children. And uh, this sentence can literally be a death sentence for her. Whereas with exactly the same sentence, I have no work tomorrow, is said again in native English by a successful double income, no kids lawyer in central London. This might be something that he has been longing for for years. I have no work tomorrow. Finally, I can go on holiday. And maybe because of that, he does not get a heart attack and does not die. So we have to be aware that language can only be seen in context of the culture of the person, because even amongst native speakers of the same language, it can have such extremely different meanings. Right. And if it's said by somebody working on your project saying, I have no work tomorrow, that basically means I, I, I have nothing to do tomorrow. I'm working on your project. Give me something to do because I have completed all my tasks. Correct. So, yeah, as you said, it, it's very easy to, to uh, you know, put assumptions into a sentence until you know what the background is how this person is embedded in the conversation that you have with them. Exactly. You're right. right. Okay. Um, then uh, an addition, another way of how to make um, yourself more intercultural as a project manager is to adjust your management style, you say. So how should I adjust my management style? Um, and, and why should I adjust it? I mean, it's my management style. It's my culture. And shouldn't I just, you know, continue to do that? And, and we talk about that at the beginning. That's the way I am. This is the way how I manage. Uh, why should I adjust? People from different cultures have different expectations and different experience of how management is supposed to work. Some people are coming from, for example, cultures that, have, uh, that are very hierarchical. For example, Russian culture. If you manage Russian people or you think you can manage a team in, in Russia by saying that, oh, here we have the general goal of the project, so please everyone see what they can do towards achieving their goals. You will not get anything done because they expect you to be authoritarian. Um, they will simply not not accept you as a manager if if you are too soft, if you know what I mean. Whereas somebody from Sweden or Switzerland might be totally different. They, they, uh, they don't like it if they get micromanaged, they get um, frustrated and they will not perform. And they might drop out of your team. I think you have to, to consider the needs of your team members. It can also be the case that if, if they, they are used to a very authoritarian management, they are insecure if you don't tell them exactly what to do and, and how to do it. Whereas, on the other hand, people who are used to working very independently, um, they, they would like to, to continue with that style of, of management. So you might have to display different management styles, even in, in the same project with different people. But that requires that you know what kind of management style the people expect, right? Right. So how do I know that? There is some, some general studies available as to, to how um, much power distance people are used to in different cultures. There is uh, some studies about um, authoritarian versus collaborative, cooperative um, working styles in these countries. But um, the very best thing is to really ask them, to ask how has your manager been treating you? What did he or she say to you when in this and this situation? What would you like? What, what would you like me to, which kind of manager would you like me to be for you? 
I, I have made the experience that it's always always best to to ask people directly what they want. All right. So we had the first three of our six ideas here, including intercultural issues in the kickoff session, considering language, and then adjusting your management style. And moving on to the fourth, and we're kind of coming back almost to language a bit. And this one is listen carefully, repeat and rephrase. I think this is generally a good thing to do, not just on intercultural projects. Yes, you're very right, Cornelius. But of course, intercultural management adds an extra complication to that in that the assumptions of people are, dif- of people are different. And as we said before, they might not communicate in their native language. Neither might you as a project manager communicate in, in your native language. So uh, you should listen extra, extra, extra carefully and make sure that the main um, topics of any conversation that you repeat them, you rephrase them in your own words. You ask, did I understand you correctly that? And you, you uh, rephrase it with your own words just to ensure that you, you are on the same level, you, you're going in the same direction and that there is no, no misunderstandings, both from a language perspective, that you might not know all the words that somebody is using, and also from a content perspective that... Because, as we said before, it's the cultural context that gives language and words the meanings. All right. And just to do exactly as you have told, did I understand you correctly that you're saying on my project, I should always have my ears open. I should listen to what people are saying attentively. And the core, the center of what they are saying should be repeated to them so that uh, that there is an understanding, an agreement between the two. Is that right? Correct. Absolutely. Okay. And did I do it right, this this whole thing you did as well? Perfectly, Cornelius. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, a quick learner here. <laughs> a- applied interviewing <laughs> techniques. <laughs> All right. And then we're moving on to the next uh, item that should help us to become uh, better at from managing intercultural projects, be aware of different expectations. Right. Um, a culture always comes with a, with a set of exam- assumptions and expectations. So uh, an easy example we've already mentioned last time, um, it's timing. If I tell my people, my project team, we have a meeting at, at 2 o'clock, I have an expectation that they will be there latest five minutes past two, whereas they might have an expectation that uh, half past two, quarter to three is, is sufficient for me to turn up. The same goes if I ask them to do something, I can do that in a very strict way that I say, now, listen, I need exactly this and I need it by tomorrow. I need it at 7.30 tomorrow morning. And uh, my expectation is then that I get exactly what I have asked for and not just part of it and not just the first draft. But um, in, that, in another person's culture, they might be used to just, uh, just producing some, some basis for further discussion. So we have to ensure that, that our expectations are the same in that um, that we make it ex- very clear we might be used to to doing this we might be used to turning up at the meeting at two o'clock for us there is no real need to discuss this but if i'm working with people from other cultures i have to discuss it ex- explicitly and i have to tell them openly my expectation is that everybody is there on time Okay, so you're saying that this is something that you just say when you say, okay, we're going to have a team meeting tomorrow at two o'clock. And uh, when I say two o'clock, I really mean two o'clock. I expect everybody to be there uh, one to two minutes early so that we can start exactly at two o'clock. Yes, that's obviously always the best if you you really discuss this openly. Right. And of course, if you don't discuss this openly... What's going to have to happen is you're going to be there at two o'clock. Nobody shows up. They're showing up at a quarter past. 
And the first thing you're going to have to do in the interview, in, in, in the meeting is you have to go in, you put this difference in expectation on the table and say, look, folks, my mistake. I didn't ex- tell you what my expectations was. Here is what I had expected. It's my fault. We're 15 minutes late. But next time, this is my expectation. Yeah. I want you to be on time. Or the other way around. You can also go and say, okay, I dropped my expectations in favor of the other. Oh, of course. So uh, Right. But then you have to ask, what is your expectation when I say yes, we meet at two o'clock? Exactly. Okay, and then you have to find, then you have to define, okay, which of these two expectations yeah. are we going to follow? Yeah, but it's actually a good point that you mentioned that be, because um, we should not, as a project manager, assume that our way is the better way. Uh, we can learn a lot from other cultures and uh, maybe make some compromise or maybe completely go somebody else's way, do what somebody else is, is used to do. It doesn't always have to be my way. Right. And that leads nicely into the uh, sixth and final item that we can do, and that is to be patient, humble, and willing to learn. Absolutely. Uh, You should not, in an intercultural setting, expect that everything is working as usual from day one. Um, You need a certain amount of patience. People need to to get used to you. You need to get used to people. People need to get used to each other's, to everyone's expectations, to their management styles, to their work habits, and so on. And uh, be humble. This is what we've already already touched slightly. Um, Don't be gross and say, hey, we've always done it like this, and I want it like this. And uh, think about... Maybe somebody else is right, and it's not really, really required to be there at two o'clock sharp when everybody is coming back from lunch. Maybe you could spend some time reading through your emails while you wait for the others. It's not maybe the best thing to be really there at my own time and meet my own expectations. And uh, yeah, finally, you should be very willing to learn. You should be learning about how things work in other cultures because you can uh, in you can broaden your own horizon tremendously, especially when working abroad or living abroad for a longer time. It's sometimes quite uh, enlightening that we see how that things that we don't think about how we do them that we do them. And all of a sudden we get a totally new perspective and we we can uh, think if we should not ex- accept this this new perspective and can actually be better, become better at our own job when applying somebody else's methods, somebody else's tools, somebody else's ideas. All right. So these were the six actions that we can take in order to make uh, our project management style more intercultural. So they were including intercultural issues in the kickoff session, considering language, adjusting our management style, listen, repeat, and rephrase, uh, be aware of different expectations, as well as being patient, humble, and willing to learn. And what we now want to do to to kind of close the interview is we also want to talk uh, briefly, very briefly, only about the qualities of an intercultural project manager. Now, we've selected the top three, and the the first one, obviously, as an intercultural project manager, you have to be open-minded, right? Correct. This is the most important trait that you should display as a as a manager. In fact, not only inter, when you manage intercultural projects, but in general. Be open-minded. Don't um, don't judge ideas because they are strange to you that they are bad. Have an open ear for the concerns of your team member for for what they have to say and take in as as much as you can. All right. The second one is, and this is a mouthful. Apply cultural metacognition. What do you mean by metacognition? <laughs> yeah, it, it sounds pretty complicated, but it's 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 not so easy, but it's easy to understand. Uh, metacognition is basically you think about your thinking. So you become aware of your own culture. You think about your own culture, 
what are your own expectations, what are your your own customs, what are your own ways of thinking, your own um, preferences, whatever. And uh, you then compare these to to those of, of other people. And uh, you become aware that that there are differences and there will always be. And intercultural management is not about eliminating differences. On the contrary, we should cash in on the differences. Um, but you should be very self-reflective and reflective of others that uh, things are not so obvious to other people as they are to you. And maybe vice versa, things that other people think are obvious to them that you might not understand them at the first first try. So uh, again, I can only um, I can only recommend talk to people and uh, speak to them as much as possible about how they perceive it, how they perceive your culture, how what they would recommend you to, how how you can work with their culture. And these kind of things. Um, this professor Chua from Harvard has uh, has put it in this way that if you uh, drive a car in a in a city that you've never been, you drive much more carefully. You watch out for the road signs. You watch out for traffic lights much more than when you drive in your own city. And this is also uh, what you should do with um, with culture management. Be, be more careful, watch for the signs, watch for, for hints, for gestures, um, for what people say, what they do. And finally, the third quality of a good intercultural project manager. Sounds easy, but it's probably rather difficult. It's quite simple. Have cultural knowledge. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> three words that require about three years of study. <laughs> <laughs> all right easier said than done um well then let me let me let me put this right into the final question here if we have to have uh cultural knowledge as a good intercultural project manager what kind of steps would you recommend that people can take in you know maybe tomorrow even starting tomorrow how can they have cultural knowledge um read about other cultures, meet other people. And as we said before, culture is not only about nationality. Culture is also about different professions, different gender, different demographic factors. Speak to as diverse a set of people as possible. This is what you can do by yourself. You can travel around by yourself. And uh, it's maybe... If you want to, to learn something interculturally, uh, maybe you don't buy a package holidays by which you are surrounded by other Americans who are the same culture as you, but to get to know the, the locals, the, the customs, the local food, everything. And of course, there is uh, formal training sessions, there is coaching sessions, and uh, as I've already said before, there is some there's two basic classes of such training sessions. One is... Uh, the preparation for a certain culture, for that can be for a country. If you need to go for a, a business negotiations to Finland, then you can go on a course and uh, study Finnish culture. But um, when you are like as I am, confronted with twenty, thirty cultures in the in one project, you can't do that. So you should make yourself familiar with the basics of cultural communication intercultural management there is some some rules and tools that can be applied throughout it really depends on what your personal situation is what you need it for for example if you are going to be sent out by your company to another country let's say they offer you a, a job in in brazil and you should live there for two three years or even longer then the most effective tool that you can you can go for is actually a coaching an intercultural coaching that is a bit more than just a training session before you go 
but somebody will accompany you through your settling in process there. They will prepare you to go there. They will accompany you there and they will be at your side uh, until you have finally settled in and got used to the new culture. Absolutely. And I think the one thing that we forgot to mention throughout this this whole interview is pretty much what you said at the end. If you have an intercultural project, a large intercultural project, and you need to identify and understand what the cultures are of your team members and how you can build the trust among all of these diverse people and bring them together under a project culture, then probably the best thing you can do is to simply contact Karin Brunemann and bring her on as a consultant on the project, right? <laughs> yeah, that would be one option. <laughs> <laughs> the number one step here. All right. Thank you, Karin. I appreciate your time today and, and to talk to us about how we can become better as intercultural project managers. I appreciate your time. Thanks very much, Cornelius. It's been a pleasure being on your program. And that was our discussion with Karin Brunemann on the tools for the Intercultural Project Manager. That's it for today. Thank you very much for listening. As always, you can find us on the web at pm-podcast.com. If you are a PMP or PGMP and you are looking for additional effective ways to earn your PDUs, then try the PDU Podcast. Get a new webinar and at least one new PDU every month on autopilot. Stop by at pducast.com. That's pducast.com. Please send your emails to info at pm-podcast.com. And when you write, please tell me where in the world you are writing from. And finally, we have this. It's another popular saying that we twisted for project management purposes. The saying is, honesty is the best policy. And in the project management sense, it becomes honesty is the best policy, except during a project audit. Until next time.